my grandfather worked for Stand Oil of California as a young man, and his uh, he worked in the what was called the Northern Diggings of California. So this show tonight is uh, based on information and photos and interviews that he made. He was fascinated with uh, gold mining history and the uh, history of the Wild West in that area. So uh, that's what this is all about tonight. Um, after my little talk, I have some things you can look at that I ask you not to touch. And I have a bunch of documents that you can touch. And I have some magnifying glasses, some early documents from California history. Um, so that's the deal. So while we're waiting, maybe I'll talk about some of these things. Um, can anybody guess who I haven't told? Can anybody guess what this might be? It weighs a lot. <laughs> Any guesses? We're talking about gold mining history here. Mold? This is a gold bar mold from Northern California. I thought it was a water mold. There's uh, little bits of gold still in the pore. I don't know how much a bar from this would weigh, but that's what it is. This is a nozzle from the giant hydraulic hoses. What we're going to be seeing tonight uh, is the primary cause of uh, use of mining was hydraulic mining when they would have gravity feed water come down these mountains through miles of trenches and sluices and they would blow up mountains using the newly invented dynamite and they would hose them down with these high pressure hoses and of course the gold would sink down and then that would be directed through wooden troughs where rifflers would catch the gold and that was how it was done and then you would put it in a gold bar and ship it down to San Francisco to the mint. Um, let's see, what else can we talk about? This is a piece of gold quartz. Uh, mostly I'm going to be talking about hydraulic mining, but there was also gold. Uh, at one point they realized that this gold quartz, some of it had gold in it. So you would uh, bring your gold quartz down to the assay office to determine the percentage of gold if it was worth uh, working at it. Of course, you would crush it. They have these giant crushers to pulverize it to get to the gold within the stone. Does anybody know what these might be? Again, think of mining. These are called miner's candlesticks. And you would pound that into a beam with your little candle. And you would pick away looking for gold. And then you'd pull it out and work down the mine. And, and this is a really fancy one. I think this guy found a bunch of gold. So we had a fancy one made. But it's the same idea. So I don't want to talk about the telephone too much because that's kind of the whole gist of this thing. But I'm going to start out this talk once our, our technos um, figure it out. First, I'm going to talk about my grandfather a little bit. Then I'm going to talk about the, uh, the area of Northern California where the story takes place. And then I'm going to talk about the mining and then uh, the telephone, the world's first long distance telephone in 1878. Talk about a little bit about the background, and then when the slides come up, we can jump through them a little bit. Well, I'll talk about my grandfather. My grandfather, because this is all about if he hadn't collected this stuff, right. I wouldn't be here. Yeah. So he was uh, born and raised in Nebraska. Uh, he quit school in 11th grade to help support his single mother. He worked for the railroads. He worked in a mail car. He was the guy who would put the sack, the leather sack of mail, leather and canvas sack on the hook as the train slowed down for the whistle stop. So uh, years later in, in Sacramento, there is a uh, railroad museum and sure enough, they had one of those uh, railroad cars. Um, and this is Nebraska where he grew up. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, he joined the Navy in uh, 1918, as many people did, and the war ended before he knew it, so he was mustered out, and, uh, and that's where we'll begin the story. <laughs> we're so close, we're so close. <laughs> we're so close. 
for those of you watching on live stream, uh, live stream I'm looking out at probably four or five hundred people. <laughs> Come on in, young man. We have some technical uh, difficulties. <laughs> and then, uh, <laughs> we'll commence the show. <laughs> Anyway, this is my grandfather, Jack Bull. Uh, here he is posing with uh, the original Ridge Telephone, which is here on the table, as well as his beautiful blue insulator. Um, and he was thrilled in 1965 to show the modern phone. Here he's on a modern telephone, you know, looking at this old phone. Um, this talk is based on documents, photos, and stories collected by him in the late 20s and 19, early 30s when he was living in Grass Valley, California, in the Sierra Nevada Mountains. Uh, born and raised in Nebraska, joined the Navy, blah, blah, blah. So, all right, you can click the button. So, um, maybe we can click the button. Here we go. It's not a cold. <laughs> So uh, he was also a photographer by grandfather, and in 1915 he met this young woman and took a picture of her in front of her parents' home. Uh, that's my grandmother, and uh, six years uh, later they were married. Okay, Mimi. Uh, by then he was a district manager of Standard Oil, California. He was managing a few gas stations and seeking locations for new ones. It was the Roaring Twenties now, and people wanted to go up into the old gold rush towns in the mountains. He began picking up documents in abandoned buildings and studying gold mining history in that area. Next. Uh, this is a map he drew of the area. It's probably hard to see from your seats. Um, here we have San Francisco. Here we have Sutter's Fort. Sutter's Fort, of course, turned into the city of Sacramento. And then uh, you could navigate as far as Marysville up here. And then you went up into the mountains by wagon. Eventually, there was narrow gauge railroad. This was his uh, mining district. Uh, here's uh, uh, um, Donner Lake. Donner Lake, you might uh, remember that name from California history. So uh, anyway, next. So this is his district in the northern uh, Sierra Nevada Mountains. This is the road between Downeyville and Sierra City. Uh, now in 1929, you can see there's no big timber left. All the big timber was cut. Now we're having second growth. It's coming back. His little car's down here in the foreground. He loved to photograph his car in photographs. Um, okay, uh, a slight digression. Uh, so while they're living up in the mountains, uh, of course, in 1927, as we all know, Lindbergh flew across the ocean. And so my grandfather, like many other people, was enamored of that idea. So in 1928, he spent several months at uh, the Ryan Aircraft Corporation in San Diego. They offered flying lessons. Uh, Ryan Aircraft built the Spirit of St. Louis the year earlier. So this is my <coughs> grandfather taking a selfie on his first solo flight in 1928. He's 3,000 feet above San Diego, which you can see in the background on the left. So he was quite a, he was quite a guy. Uh, next photo. This is the romantic part of the show. This is uh, my grandfather taking a photo of his wife and himself. They're in a Curtis Robin, which was a very uh, beloved uh, enclosed plane, you know, uh, started by our friend from Hammondsport, Curtis. All right, now we get to the, the real story. This is uh, Sutter's Fort in 1847. And of course, it was on the American River. And, of course, James Marshall was building a sawmill for Sutter. 
who happened to be in Washington when gold was discovered. And the next slide, please. So gold was discovered in 1848. By 1849, of course, there were waves of gold seekers from all over the world. Some of the first people there were Mormons because they were up in Utah. And this is what's called uh, Mormon Hill. This is a settlement right on the American River, just a stone's throw from Sutter's Fort. And they pretty much looted Sutter's Fort and brought everything to start these communities. Um, what else was I going to say about this? I must remember to look on my script. Um, OK, we can turn the page, please. So now, uh, you know, men from all over descended and started following these streams up into the mountains. And initially, they would do what was called uh, mining with a bowie knife, where you were just prying apart boulders to try to get to the heavy gold that had sunk, sunk beneath them. And then, of course, they started building machines. You can see this fellow in the foreground, where they would dump dirt in these things and wash water through it, and the gold would sink down into the bottom, collecting in the bottom. So there are various devices. There's a document up here that I invite you to look at later, where for a certain sum in 1962, you could use Dunning's Improved Gold Separator. OK, next, please. Uh, so now, 1858, this is Timbuktu, California, so named because it was so far up in the mountains. Um, and there's a, the, the streets are just wonderful, aren't they? Can you imagine navigating in those muddy streets way out in the middle of nowhere? And I have to tell the wonderful joke that has come down from these days, where one day a fellow was on the boardwalk and he saw a hat sitting in the mud. Well, he bent down and picked up the hat and darn if there wasn't a head underneath the hat. He said, are you all right? He goes, oh, I'm fine, but I'm a little concerned about the mule I'm riding. <laughs> Next, please. <coughs> so by 1858, it was hydraulic mining. Uh, hydraulic mining, uh, they would, uh, again, as I mentioned before, uh, Nobel's dynamite had just been invented, earning him the money for his future Nobel prizes. But uh, So Americans were buying tons and tons of dynamite, blowing up these mountains, high pressure hoses. Again, miles of trenches had been dug, dug by Chinese workers, uh, trenches and flumes bringing water down through giant nozzles like this or bigger, blasting these whole sides. I mean, the water would rip through a man. It was so powerful. And then the gold would come down, slide, and uh, the stuff would slide through these, these uh, chutes where they would have slats to collect the heavy gold. Hmm. This is the Malakoff gold mine. In the 1870s, one day, they made a 512-pound gold bar from one day's collections of gold uh, because they could. And uh, my grandfather wrote that they brought it into town. They missed the Wells Fargo stage, so they just left it on the street. And it was there in the morning because, you know, how do you steal a 512-pound gold brick? So that's the story. So next, please. Uh, to uh, speak to the amount of Chinese workers there, this is a, a receipt to the Milton Mining and Water Company because they, they sold water. The, guy, the guys who had the big money bring down the water, they would sell the water for water pressure mining to the smaller companies. This is a receipt for 7,500 pounds of rice in 1877, so you can imagine how many workers that was feeding. Um, next, please. These are, these are just here because they're beautiful. Uh, this is, again, to the Miller Mining, uh, Milton Mining and Water Company. This is a business, W.T. Ellis. I think it's Dale's great-great-grandfather, W.T. Ellis. So this is in Marysville. So you could steam up as far as Marysville, and then you could put stuff on the Narrow Gauge Railroad to a few towns, but mostly it was by wagon up into the mountains. <coughs> uh, next, please. This is just another lovely receipt from April 1877. Uh, the Pioneer Woolen Factory, they're selling sluice blankets. So these would have been blankets in the bottom of these gizmos to catch the tiniest of gold pieces. And look at the hills of San Francisco, some of the most expensive real estate in the world now. And there's hardly anybody there. Of course, the city burned three or four times, so you're not sure, you know, we're not sure or the history of fire that was. Uh, next, please. Um, this is the Malakoff 
gold mine as it looked in 1929. Uh, I was there 10 years ago. It doesn't look much different. But this is 1929. It already has 50 years worth of timber growing back. Uh, a note about these photographs. This is the first of a number of really nice photographs we're going to see. In a dark room, these are amazing. It looks gray and white in this light. In a, a good light, they're beautiful black and white photographs. These were taken, my grandfather in 1929 um, asked some friends at the Southern Pacific Railroad if they might send a photographer up to photograph the remains of these gold mining towns to use for tourism purposes. Because of course he's selling gasoline, so he wants people to come up into the mountains. So the, the railroad sent him the photographer, and you'll see a number of beautiful photographs he took there. Eight, it was eight by 10 view camera, meaning that the negative was eight by 10 inches. So this is the, what I have are just contact prints. They just lay the negative down on the paper. So the amount of detail in these original prints is unbelievable. And I wish I knew the name of the photographer because some of them are, are quite stunning, just as Abde Darks. Uh, next, please. Uh, this is Valleyville, uh, California, way up in the mountains. In the foreground is a pile of slag waste from mining operations. Um, my grandfather had one of the, his gas stations in this little town. Colorful place, you can still go there today, although most of the buildings are gone, but it's a charming tourist town. Wait, I want to tell one brief story. Uh, in the 1870s, there was a widow who lived on one of these hillsides, according to a story collected by my grandfather, and she did washing for the miners. And because she was a woman, they were all after her. And eventually someone won her hand. Well, didn't he strike it rich? And they became millionaires. They traveled all over the world. They had a son who was born into great wealth. Their son had a daughter who, when she became marriageable age, fell in love with a musician. Well, her father wasn't going to let her marry a musician. So he, he um, what's the word? He uh, dissolved her from the family. What's that called? Disinherited. <laughs> Thank you very much. He disinherited her. But she, she went ahead and married the musician, young Irving Berlin. <laughs> uh, next, please. Uh, this is Downeyville, California, in 1929. Uh, I've been there. It's a charming place, but it does not look like this. Uh, the building on the left is still there. It's a post office in 1929. Uh, then, it, uh, now, it, or uh, 10 years ago, it was a gift shop. I presume it's the same. If you look closely with my little pointer, you can see part of a gas station in here. That's my grandfather's gas station, one of his gas stations. This is the county courthouse, which burned a few years later. Uh, he found a lovely document in that courthouse one day when he was bumming around, because everybody knew him. He was in the local history, and he would give talks at Chamber of Commerce and whatnot. There was a document in there how a gentleman from the south had gone into the hills with his slave and had died in a mining accident. And so these two other guys chipped in and they bought the slave's freedom from, you know, the brother who came up to collect the property. These miners got together. It's, it's a movie story. Anyway, the courthouse burned down a few years later. Uh, next slide, please. This is the St. Charles Hotel. This is again the, the one we just saw for This is a terrible print, but a wonderful photo. Look at this, the Liars Club hanging out in the front porch there. This is just, imagine the adventures. This is 1929. Imagine what this would have been like in the 1860s and 70s, right? I mean, it's like a movie set. Unfortunately, it burned down, and this is going to. So the town of, uh, the town, unfortunately, yeah. Uh, next slide, thank you, Mimi. <laughs> Now, maybe it wouldn't have burned out if they had more of these. Uh, this is uh, San Juan, California. This uh, apparatus was uh, originally purchased by the city of San Francisco. It came around the horn by a clipper ship up into San Francisco. Eventually, they sold it to San Juan. This is, again, one of those 1929 photographs. Uh, next, please. This is another shot of Downeyville. And uh, again, this is gone. Uh, the only houses that were on slopes were a few residences. This is just totally gone. But this is 1929. I mean, don't you just want to be a cowboy, you know, taking a break and going to that town or a gold mine? It's just, it's all steel shutters. Everything, even behind the glass, is steel shutters because, you know, gold was everywhere. Uh, next, please. 
This is another old mining building. Uh, I'm not sure if this survives or not. What's notable is how they used brick, which had to come up by wagon, is around the steel doors and windows, and everything else is screen rock. Uh, next, please. Another building, I don't know in what town. Um, again, it's just faced with brick, and the fields, the river stone is behind it. I have no idea if this exists or not. Um, thank you. You can keep going. You're very good, Michelle. Thank you. <laughs> uh, this is San Juan, California in 1860. Um, uh, I've been there. There's a brick building left, a brick garage, and that's about it on Main Street. All these buildings are gone. Uh, but in 1860, you can see the giant sluice overhead. This is carrying water down for those gravity feed monitors. This was a, a wealthy little town then. I'm quite fascinated by this giant, giant pole in the background. It looks like a ship's mast. It looks like there's another one here. What's that all about? It's 1860. Is that for an American flag? The, the North, uh, California famously equipped Mr. Lincoln's army. Tons of California gold paid for all the uniforms and cannons and whatnot. Is that a, just a pole for a flag? But look at the size of that thing. It's, it's amazing. Telephone pole. Well, <laughs> <laughs> no, the telephone poles are like this tall, as you will see. Uh, next, please. Uh, this is a charmer of a story. So what, let's just look at this for a minute. What we have, we have a gentleman sitting on the wagon, a little parade. He's got two flags. He's over here is a young fellow. What's inside here is a whiskey keg. You will see a brass band around. Now let me read uh, what this is about. The gentleman pushing the wheelbarrow lost a bet. The rider, who won, had to drink a shot of whiskey at each intersection around town until he fell off. <laughs> until he did, all bar tabs, including a brass band, were to be billed to the loser. Oh, it cost him over $600 in $1860 before the winner fell off. Um, and the story that my grandfather heard, my grandfather got this story from the owner, the son of the white, the white loser, who was the sheriff who paid $600, but it shows how much money they had in those days, because the gold was just everywhere, and you know, you'd buy shares in a mine, it was crazy stuff. Um, anyway, the loser's son told my grandfather the story and allowed him to copy the photo, and this is San Juan, California. And again, none of this is there. None of these beautiful wooden buildings, just gone. Um, next, please. Uh, here's another example of that. Another remains of another mining town. In the 1880s, by the, by the late 1880s, the fruit growing in the Sacramento Valley was earning much more than the gold mines were earning, and all the stuff from the gold mines was washing down in the Sacramento Valley. So first the state courts and ultimately the federal government uh, said no more of that hydraulic mining. And, uh, and in no time the miners moved away and the merchants moved away and most of these towns uh, crumbled away. So here we are looking at these old crumbled towns. Next, please. Um, one moment. This, whoops. Don't touch that dial. Uh, this is North Bloomfield, California, as it looked in 1929. Uh, this was one of those tent cities that sprang up along the American River, and it was originally called Humbug, because uh, when the miners would get drunk and accidentally let slip of how much gold people were finding in this area, people would say, ah, oh, Humbug. But it turned out to be true, and a, a big town grew up there. And then again, this is as it looked in 1929. I've been to that spot. There is not one there's not one hint that there was anything there, although I would love to go there with a metal detector. And uh, these days, I bet a lot of people do. OK, next slide, please. This is Virginia City, California in 1929. It was a big mining area. You can see in the back hills the remains of uh, mines from 50 years earlier. But this town is still holding on. 
Um, and now you can go there, it's a charming little tourist town. They have an opera house that never burned down, where Caruso sang. Uh, Mark Twain in his heyday spoke there, although um, Thomas Edison had invented the, uh, the, uh, the machine to capture voice, but no recordings has, exist of Mark Twain, and he was supposed to be one of the greatest speakers of all time. Uh, next slide, please. This is uh, the houses on the hillside of Virginia City, and you can see how uh, sketchy they are, and you wonder if any of them survived. Um, but, you know, you may do. Uh, also, I should mention, this is Virginia City, California. Virginia City, Nevada was over the Rocky Mountains, home of the fabulous Comstock Silver Lode, which was a huge, uh, you know, made a lot of fortunes. Uh, and Mark Twain, as a young man, uh, worked at the Virginia City Enterprise as a newspaper because he didn't want to fight in the Civil War. So he was out in the Rocky Mountains instead. Next slide, please. This is the remains of an actual theater, 49ers Theater, somewhere in one of these small towns, I don't know which, where there were actual dancers on that stage and, you know, crazy drunken miners in front of them would literally throw gold nuggets. The dancers would, troops of dancers would come from San Francisco, Troops of dancers would come from France, I have read, and I read that they were strictly chaperoned, and the only way you could date one of them was if you married one. Yeah. So my grandfather said some of California's grandest families started here. <laughs> uh, next slide, please. Or in similar places. Uh -oh. This is another old store that says this beautiful old hand lettering, like, you know, somebody like me did years ago, where they're buying and selling gold dust and all this kind of stuff. This is too cool. Is this building still there? Who knows? Don't even know what town it is or was in. Uh, next, please. This is an assay office in Nevada City, California. And that gentleman, Mr. Ott, is uh, holding a, a sample of ore. That other character was a lineman on the original uh, Ridge phone line who gave my grandfather a lot of information that we're about to learn. Uh, Mr. Ott's father assayed the ore from over the mountain, uh, Nevada City, California, that led, uh, Nevada City, Nevada, that led to the Comstock Silver Rush, which was just a huge deal back in the day. All right, next, please. This is a scale that, uh, from one of those towns that weighed many, many pounds of gold over the years, uh, my grandfather watched it in action and it was in a glass box, so no dust would interfere with the, you know, the precious weight. Uh, next, please. And here's a receipt from Wells Fargo and Company from 1886, which would have been the end of the, that era, and it's for $2,900 gold bar. Next, please. And here's a Wells Fargo stagecoach, as it looked in 1929 or 30 with my dad and his brother climbing on it. And uh, my big joke here is on the other side of the stagecoach, that's my grandmother sending a text. <laughs> uh, next, please. Uh, now, of course, the, the, the snow cars would go on the stagecoaches, and the guys with the big mustaches would jump out of the trees and say, stand and deliver, or whatever. Uh, so this is uh, uh, where a stagecoach robbery took place, they would paint a white spot on the rocks. And where someone was killed has a black ring around it. This one has a black ring around it. And this old stage car driver, uh, stage driver is, is posed pointing to it. Next, please. <coughs> this is one of the remains of one of the mining headquarters as it looked in 1929. Next. Uh, this is another one. You can see the giant water pipe that's passing underneath because it's a, it's a water company. They're selling water. They're mining and they're selling water rights. They're using the water and selling the water to other people. In Miners Inches, it's called. Uh, next, please. Um, this is the town of Goodyear's Bar in 1860s or 70s. You can see they pretty much denuded the hillsides. They also have two giant flagpoles. They don't appear as tall as, as San Juan, but big flagpoles, uh, 1860s or 70s. Next, please. This is Goodyear's Bar in 1929. 
Uh, so 50 years later, 60 years later, you can see the scars from mining around, and I have no idea if this place exists uh, or not. Next, please. Uh, this is one of those stunning photographs I was talking about. Um, and again, in a dark room where you can see it in real black and white, it's, it's knocked out. Uh, my grandfather told me he remembers seeing this guy frequently in those days. He said he was always clean and his clothes looked stream washed. Those the words he used, stream washed. And uh, the photographer posed him beautifully uh, next to this big derrick. This is the, uh, the North Star Mine in Grass Valley, California, which is still functioning in 1929. Uh, not, he's not working there. Uh, next photo, please. These are some of the miners at the North Star Mine. Uh, next. And this is, uh, this is a 4,000 deep, 4,000 foot tunnel, straight down. They are about to go down and uh, look for gold. Uh, most of these miners were Welshmen and uh, Welsh and Cornish men from England. Next, please. Because they were experienced miners. And here they are down in the mine, you know, tink, 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 looking for that little flash of gold. It's great work if you can get it. Uh, and it was hard work, and a lot of them, you know, this is a last view of them that people had. So this is a marvelous machine. Look at this thing. There's four carved heads on the top corners. And I really hope that exists somewhere because it's a thing of beauty. I couldn't tell you what town that's in. Uh, next, please. And here's my grandfather. And he's driving around one day. And doesn't he see this? It looks like a telephone pole. So now I have to read a couple of things. So this is from the Grass Valley Morning Union in 1943. Uh, years later, uh, one of my grandfather's friends is writing about him. And he writes, uh, Wolf's discovery of telephone line. While residing in Grass Valley, Jack Wolf mixed research with business to such extent that he made discovery of numerous interesting and important incidents virtually unknown to the present generation and largely forgotten by the receiving generation. Several times while driving up the ridge road, he noticed a sagging pole bearing a wisp of rusted wire. One day he investigated and began to question old timers. The result was disclosure of the fact that long distance telephoning had its first practical exemplification, there's a good word, exemplification on the San Juan Ridge. It was a 60 mile private line maintained by the hydraulic mining companies between French Corral, French Corral and Lake Bowman and its purpose was to control the flows of water, a sort of dispatcher service. The private messages were also transmitted. Search revealed enough of old equipment, crude sending and receiving instruments, insulators, batteries, and so on, to make a sizable museum of telephony. So the mining companies, uh, you know, Thomas Edison, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, Bell, Alexander Graham Bell, a year and a half before the Ridge phone line opened, had invented the telephone. We all know this. Watson, come here, I need you. But Bell's instrument could only go three or four miles. So cities were full of telephones. I could uh, run a phone to your house, and people did. And you see photos of the cities in those days. It's a cacophony of wires. But they couldn't go long distance. So Thomas Edison uh, invented the carbon transmitter um, invented the carbon transmitter in which compressed lamp black buttons were used to obtain the necessary variable resistance in the circuit. It marked a real advance in the art of telephony, another great word, um, telephony and aided materially in bringing the Bell Telephone into practical use. Edison invented this on behalf of the Western Union Company which had set up the American Speaking Telephone Company to compete with the Bell Company. This carbon button enabled the telephone to be used over many miles instead of only four or five miles. Therefore, the Edison telephone was used by the Ridge Telephone Company on their 60-mile line between French Corral and Lake Milton in the High Sierra Mountains. This was built by Paul Seiler of the California Electrical Works of San Francisco. Prior to the phone, they were desperate for this technology because they had miles of, uh, of water upstream, and they only had riders to communicate when to open the flu floodgates. When, you know, so months of work could be negated, negated by bad communication. So they were very anxious to have this phone, and they had the money for the phone. 
Uh, next, please. This is another f photograph he took of the old phone line, and of course he had to get his car with the rumble seat in there because you know it's just one of his cars. Next, please. Uh, here it is, the Ridge telephone. This is the one that here lying on the table. Um, one moment. Don't touch that dial. Yes, next please. Of the company. Next slide please. This one says, since the organization of the company up to December 1st, 1879, a period one year, the following expenditures have been made, etc. So this proves that they were operating uh, in 1878. Uh, I believe that's four years before Bell was able to do a successful long distance line. Uh, next, please. More just daily business records from the Ridge Telephone Company. My grandfather found quite a few of these. You can see how water-stained they are. And you know, again, they're only 50 years old. It'd be like us picking up documents, invoices from the 1970s. Who would do this, right? But he was interested in gold mining. It was all about that. And of course, then he found the phone, and that was related. So it was all part of the big picture. Uh, next, please. This is an, on the right is an early one of the early guys who helped Siler install the phone, still kicking in 1930 or so, and he's holding uh, this phone here, right here. Uh, next, please. This is Payne's Hotel and Ranch in Lake City, Nevada. Look how many buildings are in Lake City. This is quite the quite the city. But anyway, Payne's Hotel. This is in the glory days, 1870s. You can see there are is a phone line on those single poles leading to Payne's Hotel because they had a phone in the lobby. The mining officials used it. You could use it for a fee. Next, please. This is Payne's Hotel in 1929. It's gone a little downhill, but you can see it still has the phone line with the insulator <coughs> on the corner of the building. Uh, those are quite valuable now, so I'm sure that's long gone. I imagine the building is long gone. Uh, next, please. This is the uh, western terminus of the Ridge phone line. This is the Milton Mining and Water Company's headquarters. Uh, my grandfather had permission to go through that building uh, by surviving people and got a lot of documents out of there. Uh, that building was restored, and I've been to that building. Although it sits by itself, the town that it once supported is no more in sight. Here are the rules of the Ridge Telephone Company. So it's hard to read all this, but this was posted by all the phones, and uh, and I think the way it worked. Let's see the next one. Me. Oh. Uh, that's a sort of a digression, but I, sh I wanted to show here that the phone was used for many purposes. This is using, uh, this is 1884 presidential election. Blaine has got 25 votes, Grover Cleveland has 30 votes. So they're using the phone, uh, 1884, for gathering electric, uh, electric, uh, electoral information. Next line, please. So if I wanted to uh, send a message to someone, I would go and, and pay, and they would write the message out and read it into the phone, and somebody would take it down at the other end and deliver the slip. So here's a, a message that they were so excited they never even put the year. The stage has been robbed near the same place. Setters and all uh, asked Caldwell and Rob how much money they shipped. So the stage has been robbed. They're trying to figure out how to recover. Uh, here's a couple of other interesting, there, there's, I have a stack of these things at home, and they're mostly fairly mundane, but I had to go through them, of course, and some of them are little gems. Um, this one says, hold the property, the court will decide in my favor on next Saturday. <laughs> so that's good stuff, if you can, if you know that. Um, this is from Moore's Flat. Moore's Flat, again, is, there's nothing there. It was a booming place, there's nothing there now. And this one says, send me $20 immediately. Don't tell the boys. <laughs> so $20 is a lot of money in 1879. So uh, this is the house of uh, General A.M. Doby. And he was a mining official. This is as it looked in 1929, long abandoned. 
General Doby probably long gone now, right? Uh, General Doby was a mining official, and as such, he had a phone in his home. Well, General Doby had a daughter, and that daughter had a piano forte that come around the horn by clipper ship up into the mountains by wagon. And what they did, they jury rigged the wire from the telephone through the cavity of the piano forte. And Nellie Doby, uh, General Doby's daughter, every evening everyone would take the phones off the line and Nellie Doby would sing and play over the piano wire. This, had, this went on for two years until she took sick, went to San Francisco, and never returned. Uh, and my grandfather remembers talking to old timers who teared up at the memory of what this meant to them and then it was gone. My grandfather said this was probably the first use of electricity to broadcast music. In 1879, they're broadcasting music to 24 different locations, right? There was no radio. In the city, they had phones, but they didn't have a series of phones because there was no phone at long distance. So this might very well be the first use of electricity for recorded music. Does the rock and roll history museum have this story? No, it does not, ladies and gentlemen. All right, uh, next, please. So in 1930, my grandfather decided he needed to go to the source. And so he wrote a letter to Thomas Edison. And Thomas Edison, he wrote a letter to Thomas Edison. He didn't save the original letter he wrote to Edison, much to his chagrin. But he, he was asking information for Mr. Edison and wondered what he might remember of this, which had taken place in 1878. And now it's 1930. Edison's a very old man. Edison writes back to my grandfather. Dear Mr. Wolf, I have been greatly interested in reading your letter of December 11th. So much has taken place in my life since the events you mentioned that they seem like a faint glimpse of long distant years. I am unable to recollect the details of your interesting history, but perhaps the photographs you mentioned might awake memories that are long dormant. Therefore, I should be glad to see the photographs you so kindly offered to send. I mean, how beautiful is that language? So my grandfather, uh, I have a photograph of my father putting a box labeled to Thomas Edison, Florida, uh, on the Narrow Gauge Railroad, and they sent him not only photographs, but they sent him one of these phones. So at the, at the New Jersey Edison Museum, the Edison phone is there because my grandfather sent it to him. Mm -hmm. uh, and he, of course, asked, my grandfather was asking Thomas Edison for questions and more information. Uh, next, please. Uh, but he got this letter back, because Edison was an ancient guy. And Edison died a few months after this. Uh, Mr. Edison duly received at Fort Myers, Florida, the original Edison telephone, which you so kindly sent him there, along with your letters. I'm having trouble reading this. Anyway, it's a thank you letter. But they say uh, Mr. Uh, Edison is unable to, uh, the language is so sweet. But he's saying because of his weakness and because of, you know, he, he's trying to do his own stuff. He, he, he's unable to answer, although he would naturally like to oblige you. And Edison died a few months later. Uh, next, please. Uh, and this is a photograph from the 1950s, and now there is a cast iron sign talking about the world's first long distance telephone line. And I'd like to believe that my grandfather helped bring this up because he kind of brought this story back from the grave. Um, next, please. <laughs> Um, I, I have some things that you're welcome to look at and not touch, and then I have a bunch of early documents and some magnifying glasses, and you're more than welcome to come up and pour over these. A lot of them have uh, documents on both sides. They're a wonderful look back into the past. Uh, here we have the phone. The bell's not attached. Um, these are different little uh, lighting whale oil lamps that you would hang in your mind to illuminate it. Here's another kind. Um, this is how the ridge phone wire was repaired when broken. This is a piece that he saved. This, um, here we have the giant hydraulic hose. This is a smaller hydraulic hose that was always a pencil can on his desk 
before he hacked it off. But it's a, you know, it's a leather hose with rivets. It's quite a lovely thing in itself. And uh, I don't know what this is, some kind of alchemy thing, uh, perhaps used chemicals were involved with, um, not with hydraulic mining, but with uh, crushing gold ore and separating the gold from the ore. So maybe it's something of that nature. Uh, and this, of course, was the gold bar mold, gold bar mold that I showed earlier that you can check out. It still has some gold in the pores. Um, and I've actually been in touch with Smithsonian Museum, and they said they don't have a gold bar mold, if you can believe that. So someday this might go there. We're in the process of doing that. But that's it, folks. Thank you to the, audience, the whole audience out there. Thank you to all my technical help. Um, brought to you by the Standard Oil California Nose. <laughs> Chris, can you remind me how your dad, your grandfather got from the Navy to Standard Oil? Um, he he first went to work for Standard Oil on a ship, and perhaps because of his Navy experience, so he was on a, a, a Standard Oil ship that went 600 miles up the Yangtze River to Peking, China, and he's like a 20-year-old kid from Nebraska, and that's how he started working for Standard Oil. Uh, I don't exactly know the transitions to regional manager. I know he also worked for the Southern Pacific Railroad for a while. Um, there's a lot I don't know. But I do have a wonderful story from when he was uh, at the Yangtze River. So this is 1918. A kid from Nebraska. It's 600 miles. You know, they've never seen white guys. He's never seen well, he's seen Chinese people because they were all over California as workers. But this was all new to him. So he had a friend who wanted to go eat. And they figured out they were directed to this place where he could get food. And they walked in and everybody was thrilled because these two sailors were sitting there. And they waited and they waited and they waited and they waited. And finally with great fanfare and a small parade, they brought out this duck that all the feathers on it and it was just this big duck and they didn't know what to do and they left some money and, and walked out. <laughs> and years later my grandfather had a Chinese friend in San Francisco and they told him, boy did you blow it. He said they take that duck, they clean everything out, they stuff it and roast to perfection and they put all the feathers back for the presentation. And so it was this gourmet delicacy that they just, these Nebraska kids said, no, no, see you later. <laughs> he also told me another story. Uh, and this is one of those, I almost could not be here. He's walking back to the ship one night. And there are large Chinese from different parts of the country. My grandfather was 6'2 at that point. But all of a sudden, on the dark wharf, on the way to the ship, a Chinese guy steps out of the shadows and says Juan or whatever, he wants money. And then another one steps out and another one, and he's suddenly surrounded by these six big Chinese guys, and they all want money. Now, he knew uh, Jiu Jitsu because the rich guy in his Nebraska town had a Chinese houseboy. So they taught the houseboy English, he taught them all Jiu Jitsu. So that gave him enough confidence to think his way through this. And he knew that that wasn't going to help him because there were six guys. But he stayed calm. He remembered he had an electric torch in his pocket. What's that? A flashlight, right? An electric torch. So he pulls it out and he shines it in the face of the first guy. Step back. And then he went around the circle. And they all stepped back and he walked to the moon. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why I'm here, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Because he had that electric torch and remembered to use it. Tell the story about the one you told me about your grandfather flying, took your grandmother up and they had to chop down. Oh, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> like I said, he was a flyer. And I could do a whole show on that. Because he took, he's a wonderful photographer and took wonderful photographs of those years. And this one day, he rented an open cockpit plane, and uh, he took my grandmother and her sister up flying. And there they are, bombing around, well, doesn't the engine quit? And now we have this, these planes, if you see them, they're just canvas over wood, you know. So the engine is this huge thing. When the engine quits, you go down, 
and he managed to go down and steer between these big, you know, haystacks. There were no bales, right? He's steering between these haystacks, and the plane wing, you know, ended up in a fence. And my aunt, the story says, jumps out of the plane and says, why is he hit the fence? You know, she had no idea that the engine quit and he saved their life. Yeah. So, uh, great story. <laughs> yes, sir. My neighbor. <laughs> I, uh, I thought maybe you'd show a picture of the Levi Strauss invoice. Uh, no, I did not. But I, <laughs> I, I have a lot of information. I could go on. I could do a whole other show on the, this stuff. I really could. But one of the, uh, what is being alluded to, what Marty is alluding to, is uh, in one of the buildings, well, uh, there was a guy named Cummings. My grandfather learned all about this guy. This guy had come out in the gold rush and went up in the mountains and became a wheeler dealer. He became a banker. He would buy and, and trade, you know, real estate, uh, selling shares of mines. He was one of the local money guys. And uh, one day he was on a stagecoach and he had his own little gold bar that he was bringing down to San Francisco. And the stage was robbed. <coughs> and uh, people were told to put all their valuables, jewelry, whatever they had out on a blanket. And he was trying to hide this gold bar. Well, one of the robbers saw it. And they got into a little tug of war, and so the other robber just went up and went, Boof. and that was the end of Mr. Cummings. And perhaps because of that, uh, his uh, friends saved a lot of his papers. And so my grandfather found a lot of his papers under floorboards in an old building. So he was a voracious seeker of this stuff. Maybe someone alluded to it. Um, anyway, there was a stack amongst Cummings things, or a stack of canceled checks about two inches tall, 1878 and 1879. 1879 was his stagecoach robbery and his death. One of the checks was to a gentleman named Levi Strauss for $500. Levi Strauss was up in the mountains selling canvas for tents. Like if you were called Mormon Hill, there were all those tents. Canvas was huge. And the story was one day a miner went up to him and said, you know, my pants wear out so fast, but those canvas tents last forever. Could you make me a pair of pants out of that canvas? Well, didn't one of his friends have a rivet machine? And the rest is history, Levi Strauss and Company. So when I found this check, I was quite excited. I looked up Levi Corporation, and I sent them a photo of his cancellation on the back. And sure enough, they said, yeah, that's, that's our guy. They offered me $150 for the check, but I decided to keep it because it's part of this whole thing. So cool. that's the Levi Strauss thing. Yeah, I was quite thrilled. He was a bunch of other checks. I didn't recognize any other names. But um, among the documents that he found uh, that I have at home is this thing that's been rolled up for so long that you, you can't really unroll it. It just goes <laughs> again. It's a congressional document of some sort from uh, W.T. Uh, Grant's term as president. And didn't W, uh, I'm sorry, Ulysses, not W.T. Grant was the store. Uh, yes. Ulysses S. Grant, <laughs> president, he signed this document. This document sat under a leak in the roof. You unroll it, there's one hole in the document. Guess where the hole is? Yeah, it says like a touch of a U and a touch of a T. So that's a $10,000 hole, ladies and gentlemen. If that, if that signature was on that document, that'd be worth $10,000. But uh, the hole got it instead. Um, yes. I, I don't want to keep you guys from refreshments, but I'm happy to answer it. I would invite you to come up and, and look at these old documents. They're pretty fun. The handwriting is uh, absolutely amazing on some of these. You know, you're reading, writing, and arithmetic. So don't be shy. Yes, thank you, Chris. Very informative. Thank, thank you, you really. Yes, there is. There is some cookies in the water up here. Uh, be mindful in July we have our summer social at the library. You're invited to that. That'll be a Sunday afternoon. And then in September the third, the sixteenth is a contra dance in Brooklyn. So please come. Enjoy. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you.